Chapter 2 The whole town of Ipswich came to Polly Portman's funeral. A photographer from the Ipsy News was there with his camera, and there were reporters from several different newspaper millings around the outside. The Honorable Mayor Needleman himself was sitting in the pew behind Alice and her parents, wearing a dark gray suit and a pair of very shiny black wing tip -top shoes. His wife, Melanie Needleman, sat beside him in an elegant hat made of feathers. Their eleven-year-old daughter, Nora, who was in Alice, Alice's grade at school, was there too, wearing a miniature version of the same hat her mother had on. Alice didn't care much for Nora Needleman. Being the mayor's daughter, Nora sometimes gave the impression that she thought she was better than other kids. Alice had been crying her eyes out for two solid days. Her nose was as red as Rudolph, and she felt like a slice of Swiss cheese inside, all lump and full of holes. Her mother was sitting next to her, wringing a handkerchief like she was trying to strangle it, and on her mother's other side sat Alice's father, looking utterly miserable in a chi-wool suit. Just as Reverend Flowers was gearing up to deliver the elegy, a boy named Charlie Erdling showed up and squeezed into the seat beside Alice. "'Sorry about your auntie,' he whispered. Apparently he didn't know that only family members were supposed to sit in the front row of a funeral. Alice's mother gave Charlie a dirty look, but he didn't seem to notice. Alice didn't care if he sat there or not. She was too sad to care about anything any more. Reverend Flowers cleared his throat and began to talk about all the good things Polly Partman had done for Ebbswich and how much everybody had loved her. "'Who among us has not benefited from the bounty of Polly's gifts? Her ready smile, her generosity of spirit, and, of course, her delicious pies.' His eyes grew moist, and his voice trembled with emotion as he continued. "'Thanksgiving and this personage, personage will never be the same without one of our sublime pecan pines, pies gracing the table.' All around her, people started snuffling back tears and blowing their noses like foghorns. But Alice was all cried out, so when she felt the lumps start to rise in her own throat, she looked around for something to distract her and settled on Charlie Erdling's dirty fingernails. Alice had known Charlie for most of her life, but they weren't friends. Like Nora Needleman, he'd been in her class at school that year. Charlie was tall for age and skinny. He had gigantic feet and bright orange hair that he wore in a flat top. The sides clipped so close to his head you could see the pinkness of his scalp showing through. Polly Portman had hired Charlie from time to time to do odd jobs, like emptying the trash or to touting groceries home from the store. As Alice studied his fingernails, each with a little crescent of black grease wedged beneath it, he found herself wondering if any one, of one in the Erdling household had ever heard of soap in a fingernail brush. When Reverend Flowers finally stepped down from the pulpit, Charlie poked Alice in the ribs with a pointy elbow and jerked his thumb toward the front of the church, where Polly's coffin sat with the lid propped open. "'You gonna pay your respects to your auntie now?' he asked. Alice shuddered. The last thing she wanted to do was look at Aunt Polly's body lying stiff and cold in that long wooden box. She hoped her aunt's spirits was far away, happily baking pies for a bunch of hungry angels up in heaven. "'You go ahead if you want,' Alice said, slumping down in her seat. "'I think I'll sit here for a while.' Alice's parents said their respects first, or paid the respects first, followed by Mayor Needleman, whose wife managed to orchestrate things so that the mayor would be the one to take Alice's mother arm and lead her up the aisle with the photographer from the Ipsy News snap pictures of, for the paper. The mayor was running for re-election, and his wife, who also happened to be his campaign manager, knew a good photo opportunity when she saw one. Only the week before, the mayor had posed for a picture when Polly in the pie shop for an article that was so that, that was to appear in Life magazine. Alice had learned this not from her Aunt Polly, who was modest about such things, but from the mayor's wife, whom Alice and her mother had run into at the grocery store in the frozen food aisle one day. Did you hear about it, Ruth? Mrs. Needleman had bragged. Life magazine, with the election coming up in November. Well, the timing couldn't be more perfect. Henry, of course, didn't even want to do the interview. He hates talking to reporters almost as much as he hates giving speeches. But I told him only a fool would turn down that kind of publicity. You know what they say. One minute the mayor's office, the next minute the Oval Office. President Newton does have a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Alice's mother was not a big fan of Melanie Needleman, whom she found self-centered and too tightly wound. As Mayor Needleman led Alice... Alice's mother up the aisle by th of the church after the funeral, his wife followed a few steps behind him, brushing dandruff flakes off his shoulders in between the bursts of flash bulbs. 
Mrs. Needleman was so concerned with the task at hand that she didn't notice the elderly, white-haired woman in the black veil attempting to get past her. Finally, the woman, leaning heavily on her cane, tapped Mrs. Needleman on the shoulder with a gloved hand. "'Do you mind, dearie?' she croaked. "'I'm in a bit of a hurry.' Melanie Needleman stepped to one side and let the woman pass. Then she returned her attention to her husband's dandruff. A few minutes later, a big green Chevrolet pulled out of the church parking lot and drove off into the direction of the pie shop. Alice didn't feel like going outside, where she'd, where she'd have to listen to a bunch of people blubbering about how much they were going to miss her Aunt Polly and her pies. Nobody was going to miss Polly as much as Alice would. There was still plenty of people left at the church paying their respects, dressed in black, making their way single file down the aisle. They reminded Alice of a trail of ants. Looking down, she saw that her shoe had come undone and bent to tie it, making a double knot this time to be sure that it held. When she sat back up, she noticed a tall woman in volu volu voluminous black dress looming over her aunt's scope and casket. The woman wore a large ring on her second on the second finger of her right hand that sparkled and flashed in the sunlight, glittering into the church, filtering into the church through the high arched windows above. Even though Alice couldn't see her face, she knew who it was right away. Miss Garth, the principal from her school. Always dressed that way, in clues so loose he could have fit a second person inside, and still have still had room to spare. Alice was afraid of Miss Girk. In addition to the strange way she dressed, there was an oily, glistening quality to her skin that reminded Alice of a snake. Mrs. Miss Girk's pet peeve was tardiness. She would stand inside the front door, grabbing kids by the hoods to their jackets and frog-marching them straight to her office if they arrived so much as a second after the bell had rung. Since kindergarten, Al since kindergarten, Alice had always made it a point to get to school at least fifteen minutes early. As Alice watched from her seat in the pew, Miss Girk bowed her head, resting both hands on the edge of the casket. When she had finished paying her respects, she did something curious. Instead of turning away, she leaned over the casket and slipped her hand into it, almost as she intended to lift Polly's head up and kiss her goodbye. She must have reconsidered, Alice decided, because Miss Girk quickly jerked her hand back back out and walked away, hurrying up the aisle and out of the church without looking back. Alice stayed until the whole place had emptied out, and the last of the mourners had left. It was peaceful then, and quiet, a perfect time to reflect on the many special moments she and her Aunt Polly had shared together. She recalled a time she'd stopped by the, toy sho the pie, pie shop on her way home from, the s from school one day and found her aunt squeezing lemons for a batch of lemon chest pie. "'Can I go fishing?' asked Alice, happily hopping on the red stool. Polly finished squeezing the last of the lemons and passed the bowl to Alice. Then she handed her a fork. "'Fish away,' she told her. "'Mum says you could be a millionaire if you wanted to be,' Alice said, as she began to fish out the slippery white lemon seeds with a fork and drop them into the little dish her aunt had placed on the counter beside her. "'Don't you want to be rich?' "'I'm already rich in all the ways that count,' said Polly. "'And so is your mother, even if she doesn't know it yet.' "'If you say so,' said Alice. "'But I hope you've got that recipe locked up someplace safe. "'Don't worry,' Polly smiled and tapped the side of her head. "'I've got it right here.' "'While she waited for Alice to finish, "'Polly absent-mindedly fiddled with the brass keys "'that hung on a chain around her neck. "'She was forever doing that, "'tucking the, the key into the top of her blouse "'or tugging on it while she was talking. "'Alice loved the way it would sometimes dangle down and twirl, "'catching in the light as her aunt slipped a pie into the glowing oven. It was the only key to the pie shop, pie door shop, and Polly always wore it around her neck for safekeeping. When the last of the seeds had been removed from the lemon juice, Polly sent Alice to the pantry to get some sugar. While she went and fetched the basket of fresh brown eggs someone had left on the doorstep that morning, "'If I ask you something, do you promise you'll give me an honest answer, Aunt Polly?' Alice asked, resting her elbows on the counter while she watched her aunt carefully rinse off the eggs. "'Of course,' Polly told her. Ask me anything. Do I have an act of imagination? Absolutely, Polly said, cracking an egg smartly against the rim of the bowl. That's what I was afraid of, said Alice with a sigh. What do you mean, Polly asked. An act of an imagination is a wonderful thing to have. Mom doesn't think so, Alice confided. She thinks it's annoying. Pish posh, Polly said, tossing aside the empty shell and grabbing another egg. Sometimes I make up little songs, said Alice. Mom says that's especially annoying. Polly got a faraway look in her eyes. 
Your mother used to sing all the time when she was a little girl. She had the voice of an angel. Really? Alice couldn't even remember even having heard her mother sing. It was a joy to listen to her, said Polly. Mom says I'm tone deaf, Alice said. Join the crowd, Polly laughed sympathetically. I couldn't tell the difference between flat and sharp if my life depended upon it. So how about singing me one of your little songs? Right now? Alice asked. Polly nodded, so Alice jumped off the red stool, cleared her throat, and sang a song she made up right on the spot. Aunt Polly's pies are hot and round. Eat em in a chair or sitting on the ground. Huckleberry, blackberry, peach, and prune. Eat em with a fork or eat em with a spoon. Sorry I didn't sing for that, but... Anyway. When Alice had finished singing, Polly threw her arms around her. Bravo, she cried. I've never heard of a prune pie, Alice told her. But sometimes you have to stick strange things into songs to get the rhymes to work. I left it, Polly said, prunes and all, and I love you too, Alice. I wish I could sing better, Alice said. It's important to be grateful for the gifts we have, Polly told her. You were a wonderful songwriter. Don't you ever forget that. Alice felt all warm and gooey inside, like one of her Aunt Polly's pies. She wanted to stay there in the pie shop forever. Aunt Polly was the only other person Alice knew who liked cream cheese and olive sandwiches. That's what they had for lunch the day Polly died. It was a Friday in the middle of July. School was out, and Alice had come over to the shop to help her aunt string a bushel of rhubarb for his rhubarb pie. At noon they took a break and ate their sandwiches upstairs, sitting across from each other at the, table, at the kitchen table. And Polly said she wasn't feeling well and wanted to lie down for a bit. Alice covered her with a leopard print quilt that lay folded on the foot of the bed. And as she bent, bent to kiss her, her aunt's smooth cheek, Polly Portman whispered those final words, Thank you very much. By morning, she was gone. Alice wasn't sure how long she'd be sitting there alone in the church thinking about her Aunt Polly. But when she stood up, she found that her left foot had gone to sleep, so she jiggled, jiggled it a little to wake it up. She had every intention of going outside to find her parents, but for some strange reason her feet carried her down the aisle and deposited her, deposited her right in front of her aunt's open casket instead. She had to admit, they'd done a good job at fixing her up. Her hair was curled and she had a nice shade of pink lipstick. But as Alice stood there gazing down at her Aunt Polly, she got the strangest feeling inside. She couldn't quite put her finger on it, but something was not right.